Yep. And this is our first episode of the Art of Hunting. Very first episode of the Art Hunting Podcast. And, um, you know, we, uh, over social media and over the years, obviously I post a lot of art stuff. Um, but I'm very rarely on camera uh, myself. And so, you know, this podcast is just to give a little bit of a deeper dive um, to help learn more about our business, what we got going on, connect with our followers, and just give people more of a behind-the-scenes look at who, who I am as an artist, what we do here, and why we do it. So this is episode one. We've got nine planned out so far of actual episodes, and then we're going to go from there. See where it, see where it takes us. Exciting, exciting. All right. So first question is just going to be kind of get to know you kind of things. So mm-hmm. you're an artist. What is your favorite color? My favorite color is green. Why? Um, really don't know. <laughs> I have no good answer, no solid reasoning for that. I remember there was a. Uh, I've, I've seen some uh, studies before where people always think that like they're super cool and unique but you ask them what their favorite color is and it's like the stats say like 70 percent say blue or something like that and it's kind of like i think it's more of like an earth tone like they're the sky is blue the grass is green you know stuff like that so i think people naturally are more inclined to to be a blue uh but i'm a green i don't know why do you have a favorite subject you like to paint uh Really, I like turkeys. Um, I really like to paint deer and running deer, especially, and birds in flight, because I think there's a lot of action, a lot of fluidity, a lot of motion, you can say there. But turkeys are my favorite, but I have really, I, it's a struggle painting their feathers. You can't abstract them. Like, you know, with feathers or with fur, you can paint sort of a base layer and then pop some palette knife on top of that, kind of abstract that. It's all about the same tone, same value. But feathers, there's no way around it. you got to paint every freaking one. And um, you, that that is uh, that can be a challenge. Um, the other thing that's hard about them, too, is that they have that iridescence. And things like that are so hard to paint because it's very fluid, very, you know, that bird turns a little bit and all the all the iridescence changes. So trying to nail that down to figure out how you want to paint that in a painting and then executing on it is a challenge. But I like turkey hunting, so turkeys are my favorite to paint. Are turkeys your favorite animal to hunt? Yes. And really, I love I love the springtime. I love, um, you know, being able to, to, to move around and experience new terrain. Um you know, turkeys are kind of turkeys all over the place. Yeah, some are a little bit different. The heart of the hunt, swamp birds are different than field birds. But for the most part, you can go about anywhere and, and hunt them um, and not have to completely reinvent the wheel on how you hunt them. So um, I like being able to travel. I like hunting with my buddies. And I like chasing turkeys around here, around my studio. Um, you know, most of my best little honey holes are within a mile or two of my studio. So we will have turkey strutting outside the studio here in the spring, and I love that. Ooh, sweet. Mm-hmm. All right, so probably some people don't know if they know, or they might know, that you graduated with a degree in graphic design, mm-hmm. um, So, and you're a wildlife artist. So would you say you're a wildlife artist who's a graphic designer, or a graphic designer who's a wildlife artist? Interesting question. Um, <clears throat> in thinking about that, I would say ultimately um, I am a communicator and a storyteller. And I just do that visually. So I learned um, in college studying graphic design and then in my first few years at the Turkey Federation as a, as a designer that all of design is communicating. You're trying to communicate um, uh, an emotion, a feeling. Uh, you're trying to visually communicate a story. And we, we, we really, that's the nature of what we do as, as a designer is a lot of times in the editorial, you would get a story and you have to figure out a way to interestingly tell that and communicate that visually. So you're literally taking the copy, the images, illustrations, fonts, all that, and having to tell a story. And I don't think that that changes when you move into painting. You're still trying to communicate. 
Um, it might be you're trying to communicate a moment in time. You're trying to tell a, a larger story with a with a painting. Um, you're just instead of doing it with on a Mac in InDesign and Photoshop as a designer and illustrator, uh, I'm trying to do that with a brush and oil paint. So it's more of a communicator that can use design and oil paint to tell a larger story. That's my way of ducking your original question <laughs> with a long-winded answer. But it really is true. I mean, um, it, it, all forms of, of art are really communication and, and inspiration. You're either trying to entertain or inform or both. And I feel like that's a, something that's really helped me overall. Like with our prints, um, like the growth and maturity prints, a lot of the infographic type stuff that I create for social media, uh, that is combining art and design, sketches, information, type, uh, textures, and doing all that. So I really don't see it, you know, I can take a piece from, from fine art, transfer it to a digital image, and then change it to be more of a graphic design piece and, and take all of those skills into one uh, print or piece of content or something like that, so kind of all works together. Mm -hmm. What would you say the business side of being an artist looks like? A lot of times we say that it's not just paint brushes and pencils every day. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> um, you know, I, I am kind of a, like a self-improvement junkie. I listen to a lot of audio books and, and read and study and everything. And, and honestly, I probably study more and read more on business than I do art. Um, just because that's the part that doesn't come as natural to me. Um, I have learned that it, it's important. You know, um, if you're going to do something and you want to do it as a professional, as a career, you cannot ignore the business side of it. And, and everybody who, who does it well from professional athletes to musicians to artists to plumbers to restaurant owners, anybody that, that does it well and does it for a career and does it for the long term has to pay attention to the business side of it. And my natural inclination is more of like a, a, a technician, a craftsman. I just, I just want to be left the crap alone and sit in my studio and create work. But I have learned over the years that if you're going to do it and do it well, you have to pay attention to the business side. You you cannot abdicate your responsibility as an entrepreneur or a business owner to somebody else. That's how sorry about knocked over water bottle. That's that's how people get get screwed. You know that's that's the that's the athlete who gets screwed by his agent and ends up bankrupt after they after their career is because they didn't pay attention to it. But you know the the to, to go to sports. I make a lot of sports analogies, but like the athlete that pays attention. And, and knows the business, understands the business, and can deliver on the field or the court, those are the ones that win long-term. And it, it varies a lot, too. So, for example, um, you know, a lot of people don't know, like, we've got three employees now. We're doing a lot of different stuff. We're doing a podcast now, <laughs> you know. And um, it, for example... Leading up to Seawee, to the Southeastern Wildlife Expo, I was the featured artist there this past year, and that's a lot of work. And for six months, I really didn't do anything but paint and execute and, and create and hit deadlines and get ready for that show. Seawee was about a month ago now, and I literally haven't picked up a paintbrush since. And I've worked every single day. I've worked some nights, some weekends, and what I've had to do is go back into the business. You know, a lot of our people here are new, so we're doing stuff for the first time. We're, 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 we're trying to get dialed and get set on where we're going from here. And, you know, right after Seawee, we had three days of all day meetings. Um, I've had been in a bunch of meetings since then. Uh, a lot of my typical days have involved talking to accountants, talking to lawyers, talking to, uh, vendors, talking to agencies, uh, creating ads for social media, creating social media graphics. There's probably only been a handful of hours since Seawee that I have actually sat down and created anything. Now that can't 
that can't happen long term. I got to get back and, and, and produce them in a studio. But my point in that is that you can't ignore the business side of it. Um, we, you know, we, we sell products now. And so in, in my uh, former full-time job as a, as a graphic designer, that's more of a service business. That's a, you put me in the corner with a Mac and Photoshop and InDesign and a project and a deadline, and I'm creating something as a service for that client. What we do a lot now is we have a product. And so that means we have, we have vendors, we have suppliers, we have um, inventory, we have people, we have all kinds of stuff like that that we have to manage. We have margins we have to hit, we have taxes we have to pay, sales tax. There's, there's a whole huge bucket of stuff um, that has to happen on top of that that people don't realize. And so my day-to-day life, even though there's times I wish it was just paintbrushes and pencils, the, the full picture of what that looks like is a lot different than most people think. Um, I'll also add there, there's a way that I have seen artists do it successfully. There's two main ways. Um, one way is that they have an agent that handles their work or a gallery that represents them, and they literally they want to be left alone and create in their studio. The gallery handles the business. The agent handles the licensing. They literally don't do anything but create new work, and someone else handles the business. Um, that can be convenient, but you know that gallery is taking fifty percent. The agent's taking fifty percent. They're taking a big chunk of that. Um, so that's one way to do it. If you if you're not wired to be business minded, the other way is that a lot of times artists have a spouse that handles all the business. I've seen a couple artists do that successfully where. Um, the artist just does nothing but create and the spouse, obviously they have a vested interest in the success and the spouse handles all the business and handles everything. And that artist, the the more the artist produces, the better off everybody does. Um, I haven't really fit into either of those molds and, um, you know, I can, I understand the business side. I, I like it a lot of times. Um, and I think it's an important part of the overall art in general. And so I haven't really fit into either of those two molds, and I've kind of formed my own way to do it from there. Um, how would you say you give back to the outdoors? Is there a legacy that you would want to leave? Yeah, so um, we'll, we'll take it back a little bit further. I was one of the fortunate kids who grew up in small-town America, uh, on a farm and you know we had we had three farm ponds out the back door um, we had about uh, 150 acres we had some livestock uh, 20 25 head of cattle when I was younger um, and I really enjoyed growing up that way it was, looking back especially now you know since I've graduated at school I've lived in a couple of you know cities bigger bigger towns and I've seen a lot of ways, and I just can't imagine growing up any any other way. I can't imagine not being able to go fishing whenever I wanted or, you know, build a fort in the woods or anything like that. And I, I really, I took that for granted just because I didn't know any better. Especially, you know, back in those days, we didn't have social media. We didn't have the internet. <laughs> you know, this, I was born and I was raised in the 80s and 90s, so like, you didn't know what you were missing. I didn't, I didn't. There was no way I ever could have known what it was like to not grow up on a farm unless I traveled there because you couldn't see it. So I felt really fortunate there. And when I graduated school and started working at the the Turkey Federation, um, it it sort of broadened my horizons uh, to what conservation means, what land management is, land stewardship is. You know, I didn't, there's no way I could have known until like I got there. Um, I learned a lot about conservation when, when I was, uh, you know, when I was growing up, a Turkey Federation banquet was in our VFW hall and, and you know, it was smoky, <laughs> you know, there, there was, you know, farmers drinking too much beer and, and spending too much on art and stuff like that and wanting to win a gun, you know, everybody wanted to win a gun, um, 
I remember uh, this guy, David Reno. He was a mountain of a man, just a big dude, had a huge wingspan. So all of us kids, you know, we'd get – We'd get money from our dad and run up there, and we wanted David to stretch our raffle tickets for us because he could get like 70-some tickets, you know, and our little arms couldn't get enough tickets. So that's what I, that's what I uh, remember growing up. Um, and I thought that the Turkey Federation was literally just my RD. That's all I knew is my Turkey Federation is my regional director. We have a banquet, and I get a magazine, and then I like to turkey hunt. When I actually went to headquarters, though, you start to realize, you know, that was a 225, 250-person organization when I was there. Um, they have an entire floor of conservation people. They have an entire floor of outreach. We had an entire wing of communications. Uh, we had six designers on staff. We were producing four different magazines. And you have you have entire people who are their their job in conservation is just to work with the government to match up grants with dollars raised and conserve habitat with that and you start to think like man i had no idea conservation was this big like it's a it's a big machine and it takes money to do that it takes effort it takes you know donations but it also takes people to put that that money to work um so it, it broadened my horizons that conservation is way different than like us turning 15 acres over to CRP. Like it's a bigger deal than that. And I also learned that when I, when I, I saw some of the behind the scenes on how that money is raised. And at the Turkey Federation, one of the biggest, well, the biggest revenue generator was banquets. And far and above... Art was the one of the highest um, revenue earners. It was one of the most profitable items they had in those banquets. And I have seen art just over the years raise tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars potentially for conservation. Um, I remember I had a piece in the core pack a while ago called Sons of Thunder. And I'd have to go back and get the actual numbers, but I'm, I'm for sure it raised over 300 grand through their banquet system for conservation. And so I've always told people I've, I felt like I could do more to help the Turkey Federation and help conservation as an artist now doing what I do, working where I work, than when I was a full-time staffer there working inside the building. Um, you know, you think about what art can do and the dollars it can raise, the stories it can tell, the, the, the potential of art to help fund and fuel conservation work is far more than I could do as a graphic designer. And so I think that is a, is a pretty cool legacy I could leave over time. Um, obviously, you know, with our line of like growth and maturity prints and uh, waterfowl prints, I really want to change that. I want to, I want to contribute to the atmosphere of hunt camp. So nothing would make me prouder than for people to refer to their their piece in hunt camp as like the Kirby piece come check this one out and and you know I want to create stuff that 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 grandsons want from their grandpa when they pass like hey I want the Kirby piece from hunt camp when when the time comes you know that that is what fuels me now and what drives me now so to I guess to, to land the plane, as Mad Dog likes to say, uh, to land the plane here, um, it would be to change the, change the atmosphere of hunt camp, to contribute to that and leave a legacy there, but also leave a legacy within the conservation world of what we did with art. She doesn't like the question. I, I want to change it. I feel like <laughs> anyway, um, can you, how would you describe your, like, do you have certain words that you think would describe your work? Like, describe my work? Yeah. Um, I, I occasionally get asked that a lot. I, I like to say that my work is loose but accurate. Um, in the art world, there's a term that goes around like loose painterly brush strokes and you know I'm I'm really not much of an artist like personality I'm kind of a 
I don't know. I'm kind of a farm kid. I I like sports growing up. I like to hunt. I just don't, um, I don't like to throw around a lot of artsy terms. Um, you know, like the, the term G clay. So, uh, canvas G clay is basically a printing form and the amount of times I have had buddies like, Hey, how, how much is one of them G clays or how much is one of them? You what do you call them? Gickly? Gickly? Jiggly? How do you say that? You know? <laughs> so we just started referring to them as canvas prints because like, that's what they are. Uh, G clay is just the printing process. It is a canvas print. And rather than, <laughs> rather than try to answer that question all the time, um, we, we went to canvas print. So I'm all that to say, I'm not the kind of guy that like throws around a ton of like high society artsy terms, you know, like my version of the high life is Miller high life. <laughs> so, uh, um, but there, there, there's a term like loose painterly brush strokes. Well, average people doesn't know what a painterly brush stroke is. Every brush stroke is a painterly brush stroke because a painter painted it, right? Well, it's more, um, instead of physically painting and refining and doing every blade of grass, I might abstract that a little bit with a larger brush, um, a palette knife. Um, it's not abstract because if you back up, you can actually physically see it's representational work, but you get up close and it's pretty abstract. And I like that. Um, I like leaving a few things unsaid in my work. So instead of every single feather, every hair, every blade of grass, every leaf, everything done. Every, instead of rendering everything, I like to leave some up to the viewer's imagination and abstract that a little bit. And I also feel like it helps the viewer piece together part of, of their own experience in the painting. Um, so that's one way, but I also, I also really strive to be accurate, especially when it comes to the animal to the animal's anatomy, to the way the animal is rendered. Um, I want to do justice to the animal, like any good taxidermist. And so when you say abstract, it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like a Picasso abstraction where the eyes are here and antlers everywhere. It's more of a, if it's more of a loose style rendering. Um, but I do like to focus on the animal. I like to have the animal as accurate as I can possibly get it. Um, I tend to paint in a way that captures a moment in time. So as a hunter, you know, you'll, you'll never forget times where like that turkey came strutting up over the, the, the spring ridge against the fence row and you're just locked in, right? You're just, you're, you're so focused on that deal there. You're not paying attention to the morel mushrooms or the shed antler or the, the, the squirrel in the background. So I don't paint that stuff. Like I'm going to, well, phone ringing. This is our first interruption. Should we put Joseph on? Hello, Joseph. You're, uh, you're on a podcast right now. Oh, snap. <laughs> oh, you are? Is my truck done yet? Why not? Yep. We'll see you soon. You already did. Bye. <laughs> Dang it. We're sorry for that interruption. I'm supposed to I'm supposed to leave for Florida on Friday the turkey hunt and my truck is in the shop and they're saying it's not gonna be ready, so Oh no. We gotta figure that out. That being drama. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Back to uh back, back to the podcast. To so rookie mistake on a podcast yeah. <laughs> and you shut my Mac off and figure out a way to silence my phone better. Uh but no, I, I like to paint in a way that 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 renders um, where the way you would first experience wildlife. That's how I want to paint it, and uh, I hope that by doing that, I can capture some action and more of a moment in time. So, nice. Would you say that you have some like dedication and discipline in your work? Uh, yeah, I've, I have. Uh, I have approached work in a very like blue collar lunch pail workman like fashion and that's how I've, that's how I've always done it and a lot of that comes from from the way I was raised and the way we grew up um 
I'm not the type that sits back and waits for inspiration. I'm the type that like shows up at freaking work and we're going to hammer it out and inspiration is going to come as we go. Um, that's how I've approached everything. Um, I, I am, I am way more of a, we're plowing up the hill. That's the direction we're going. And we're like the little engine that could, um, rather than like flittering around like a butterfly, you know, like <laughs> that's a weird analogy I know, but like, instead of like, I'm going to wait to be inspired over here and, Oh, where's my inspiration? And I, you know, no, man. And, and a lot of that comes from, uh, from my early years as a designer, like you were on deadline, like you were on a, on a, on a, on track, you were on task, you have to hit deadlines. And a lot of times, you know, press dates can very rarely move. So if you're not inspired, you better find your inspiration and or orient your life to, to be that way so that you can hit those deadlines. <clears throat> and that is, is how I've approached a lot of things in life um, and work. Um, another thing, there was a there was a, a, a pastor, Andy Stanley. He did a sermon that like changed my life. I listened to it a long time ago. And um, a lot of it essentially was time management. And he talks about everything in life that is worth doing is worth doing every day in smaller increments. So you talk about uh, working out. Well, you can't, you can't eat whatever you want and drink whatever you want and then get fat and then say, I'm going to work out for nine hours straight and work all this off. Doesn't happen. You're going to get hurt. You're going to break down. It's better to work out for 20 minutes a day, every single day, and keep that weight off. Um, hanging out with your family. Like you can't, you can't neglect your family for three months and then and skip dinner time with them and then decide, okay, we're going to go to every restaurant in Boone, North Carolina tonight and we're going to eat every, we're going to eat 24 dinners and make up for the past month. You can't do that. Um, and the same thing with work, you, you've got to show up every single day and, and, and keep going, keep improving. You can't just sit back and not do anything or wait for, for, wait for inspiration and then make up for all that time you lost. Um, Another thing too is as far as the the discipline is, you know, when I first started my career, I was doing some freelance design work. When I first launched out on my own, I was doing some freelance design work and, um, and I was painting basically when the phone wouldn't ring. When I wasn't on deadline or I didn't have anything urgent, I would go into the other spare bedroom in the house I was renting and, uh, and I would paint. And you know, you hear that, that, that phrase thrown around a lot. Like it matters more what you do when no one's looking than when people are looking. Well, my whole career was the foundation of my career was set when nobody was looking, when nobody was paying attention. I'm, I had a website, but like there were no, no magazine covers. There were no appearances. There were no interviews. It, It was just me grinding in a spare bedroom. And Ironically enough, some of the pieces that we license today and that have been like some of the most popular pieces I've ever done, I painted when nobody was looking and nobody saw them for five years because I wasn't, you know, popular at all then. So people don't realize a lot of the times in art, they think that they're just going to wait for people to come to them and wait. And it's like, no, you got to go first. Like you got to make yourself put one foot in front of the other and keep walking. Like if you think that the answer to your career, or your problem is outside you and you're just waiting on someone else to help you out. Uh-uh. It's, it's you taking the first step every single day. And it's no different than, you know, physical fitness. Like if you, you can listen to an infomercial and take a pill to lose the weight. No, you got to show up at the gym. You got to make that first step and you've got to keep going from there. And that's just kind of how like my blue collar, kind of no nonsense approach to, to, to work is and to life. Um, I tell myself, or I tell people, um, you know, I grew up in the Midwest and, and people are very like common sense in the Midwest. Um, and my grandma, my grandma wanted to lose weight. And so one, one summer 
in order for her to lose weight, she would whenever her and my grandpa would drive around, they'd go to town or they'd go look at look at drive around looking at the bean fields in the evening and stuff like that. She would make my grandpa drop her off a mile from the house. And she's that's how she made herself do it. And so she, if she was going to get home, she had to walk a mile a day to get home. And you know, that that's just kind of the None of this is hard. People just have to like boil it down to the the basics, and I feel like that's one of the keys to discipline. Like it's not hard. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that complicated. You just have to do it, and you have to make yourself do it. And that's how I've approached pretty much everything in my life and career. Let's go back to when you said that you were that you leave a few things left unsaid in your work. Mm-hmm. I've heard you say multiple times, like you're you're still learning that process. Would you say you connect that to like your life in general, or would you say it's mainly just with your art? Um, that's a great question, and I remember. Um, so Bruce Miller has been one of my favorite artists for a long time. I'm just I'm a big fan of his work. I like Bruce, you know, as a, as a as a dude, and. I remember when he started out, he was, and I've seen this pattern with a lot of wildlife artists. You know, back in the day, in the 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 '80s, and I don't know, maybe '70s. I wasn't born then, but I've I've heard a lot about like the print art market in the '80s and early '90s, and that's when the federal duck stamp was so huge. That's when a lot of wildlife artists came on the scene. The print market was insane you know you you hear you talk to some of those older guys and and they start talking about how many prints they sold in the 80s and 90s like editions of 10,000 and stuff like crazy crazy stuff and that was the heyday of the the conservation groups doing the prints too and the style back then was to be extremely realistic, like as photorealistic as you possibly could. And that was like the standard. If you can if you can make it look like a photo, that was like the bar that you wanted to hit. And then I saw a lot of these artists, I would talk to them later in their careers, and you would watch their work transition and shift. And it'd gradually be a little bit looser. Um, the foreground might be a little bit more simplified than the background. And then there's a little bit more... There's more emotion. There's more feeling in their work. Um, it gets a little bit more loose. And even the artists that I've studied, like in, in books, like that'll release a book, you watch and you look at the dates and the little um, footnotes underneath each painting. And early in their career, it's like, how close can I get it to a photo? And then later in their career, it's more of a, what kind of story can I tell here? They always simplify their backgrounds. They always focus more on the anatomy and shape of the animal. And they always end up paint doing their best work late in their career. And so I started to think to myself, like, if, if it took them 40 years to get there, like, what if I could model my work after them and, and learn some of those lessons right now? You know, it's kind of like... Kind of like the old grandpa sitting whittling a stick on the porch. Like those guys have a lot of life lessons and they're pretty sharp. And if you listen to the overall lessons that they're telling you, you can apply it to yourself in the twenty in your twenties. Like, yeah, the technology's different, but the human principles are the same. The overall concept is the same. And so I started to look at some of those artists and think if they're going more simplified and they're going this direction and it takes them that long to learn it, why can I not speed up the process in my own work and try to learn from some of what's taken them so long to learn? So that's, that's, I'm not sure if that totally answers the question, but that's something that I've tried to do. Um, and probably one of the biggest compliments anyone has ever paid to me was, it was a Siwi a few years ago. And a woman had had looked at my work, and Kim gives me a hard time about this, but I ended up like bouncing around a lot and talking to other artists and not being at my spot very much. And uh, she's always like, you need to get back here. This woman wants to talk to you. And uh, so she had come through my spot, looked at all my work and everything, and um, we connected later in the day. She made, a, made it back around, and I talked to her, and, and she's like, you know, one thing that's surprising to me is you're so young for for your work. She's like, from what from what your work looked like, I thought you'd be a lot older. 
And that was at that point I was trying to, do, you know, shift my, 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 my work. And that was like literally the biggest compliment any, anyone could have paid me is that my work looked more mature than I was. And, and I felt like that was pretty cool when I was like, I like that. That's a, that's a good feeling for someone to think, for someone to judge your work and think that it's got to be the work of someone who is older, wiser, more mature, and more experienced. And then to see me, you know, I was not that young, but in my early 30s. Um, and that, that was probably one of the biggest compliments I've ever gotten. I like it. I like the podcast format. I, like I think it it'll be fun. I think we'll do. I think. Um, I think people will really grow to to enjoy it. Um, th- there's a lot of stuff that I could talk about that people don't know about my life and career and and art and hunting and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Well, catch us next episode with another fine brand. That's right. Yeah. All right. Awesome. See y'all later. Thank you guys for being here. We appreciate it. <laughs>